Well, here we are at our last topic for the semester. We're going to be exploring the role of free markets at the macroeconomic level and the impact that free markets have had on macroeconomic variables. This is particularly important at this time as we're examining the, the role that government is playing and, and the expansive role that government is having in our economy, at least in the short run, as it's passing rules and regulations to affect the operations of business at the, on, the, on the daily level, whether it's shutting down businesses or whether it's passing enormous stimulus packages to get businesses going and keep businesses open. So we want to see if there's any impact from having a free market on the overall economic performance of a country. And just to remind you, we look at this overall economic performance through real GDP per person, or specifically the growth in real GDP per person over time. That's our main indicator of how healthy an economy is. As far as what impacts real GDP per person, one of the things that economists have been researching in depth over the last couple of decades is the role that institutions play. Institutions, remember, are the rules of the game. They're the way that we um, interact with each other, the, the socially and culturally and politically acceptable uh, methods of interacting with each other. And those institutions have, um, well, they're actually really important in the overall macro success of countries. Let's take a look at a particular statement that is made by someone who you have heard of before in this class, Milton Friedman, uh, and his perspective on how institutions tie into the overall economic well-being uh, of a country. Friedman says that increases in economic freedom have gone hand in hand with increases in political and civil freedom and have led to increased prosperity. Competitive capitalism and freedom have been inseparable. This comes from Friedman's book, Capitalism and Freedom. So how do we evaluate that claim? That's a pretty bold statement, saying that economic freedom and political freedom and those two things together lead to economic prosperity. It's a statement that people have made, but in order to defend it, in order to um, actually validate that, we probably need some sort of empirical analysis that will help us to understand whether those things, those freedoms and that, that economic outcome actually do go together. Well, fortunately, there has been a, a really broad-based attempt to come up with a measure of, of economic freedom and to use that as a measure, as, and to use that as, as a variable in equations that study economic well-being. We're going to be looking at a particular measure of economic freedom called the Economic Freedom of the World Index. We'll deal with, uh, I'll get into the specifics of what the, the index contains, but it's a, it's a measure that's been around for quite a long period of time. It, it covers a lot of really interesting institutions and how those institutions affect our overall economic well-being. The Economic Freedom of the World Index also measures the degree to which the policies and the institutions of a country are, um, are supportive of economic freedom. So we can, we can try to understand the link between institutions and economic freedom and then use that as a measure to gauge economic well-being. In this index, economic freedom is sort of a proxy or a measure of the right to self-ownership. And that's important as we're going to see as we're going to break down this, this, um, this index into its component parts. It's important because... As a result, individuals have the right to choose. It, interestingly, and kind of as a side note, that, that phrase, right to choose, is, a, is the title of one of Milton Friedman's most famous works. People have the right to choose how they're going to use their own resources, their time, their talents, their, even their treasures, their money, to shape their own lives. And that's, what, that's really the, at the core of economic freedom. What can you do to improve your own well-being? What are the choices that you have the right to make in order to improve your own well-being? So let's go on now and explore some of the, the, the foundations of economic freedom.
and see what those things look like as we start to as we try to understand and try to get a grip on what's the relationship between economic freedom and political and economic well-being there are lots of things that underlie economic freedom but i want to focus in on four of them four what we might call cornerstones of economic freedom and some of these we've talked about in this class before the first one is personal choice as we've just alluded to a few minutes ago people need to have the choice of how to produce of what to produce how to produce and for whom things should be produced those those underlying questions of, of economic systems if you don't have those choices if those are imposed upon you then you really aren't free at least economically there should also be voluntary exchange you should not be forced into exchanging with people if there's no value to to it for you it, even it, even if there is value to it you shouldn't be forced into the trades you should be able to make the transactions that you want that are going to benefit you to the greatest extent and only you know that nobody else can tell you what's best what's in your own best interest because they don't know economic freedom also exists with open markets it's open markets are a component of having economic freedom because people can move into and out of markets as they see fit you can engage in transactions in the markets where you think you can earn the most where the the greatest benefit to you exists and if you're losing money you can leave those markets just as easily so basically we're talking about the importance of competition and the ability to move into and out of markets and then finally there need to be clearly defined property rights and I would add here also that you need to have a system or a set of institutions that are going to defend those property rights no matter who the individuals are no matter what their political connections but just to put a finer point on this whenever there is economic freedom individuals have the choice to decide the what how and for whom questions of economic systems if individuals can't make those choices if they are imposed upon them by some uh, political body or or any kind of inst any group beyond the individual then your economic freedom has been curtailed and it's not just political bodies that can uh, that can interrupt this idea of economic freedom if theft or fraud are allowed to be uh, allowed to run rampant in an economy in a society then individual economic freedom uh, almost doesn't exist if someone can just come along and take your things or if, if uh, officials can be bribed into limiting entry into markets you really don't have economic freedom in those cases so let's examine a couple of the things that governments can do to promote economic freedom for individuals government has the ability has the has the power really to enhance economic freedom and some of the things that we're going to mention here in this in this short list it are uh, are from Adam Smith some of the, the things we the points we talked about when we talked about what Adam Smith viewed as the role for government specifically Smith says and most economists and most people agree that governments can do a pretty good job at providing infrastructure they're able to put the roads in they're able to build bridges they're able to pay for those and at least hire the right people to do the work and if governments do a good job at that they can promote voluntary exchange in a significant and meaningful way secondly governments should be out there vigorously protecting individuals and property from aggression they should be out there defending and creating and, and bulwarking legal institutions that make individuals secure in their property and that's not just from people within your country but also from people without from outside your country this, there should be police and a judicial system to protect property inside the country and an army if necessary to protect from aggression from outside the country Smith is, is very clear on these points and most economists again and by most I'm talking 95 percent or more say these are the things governments should be doing but there is also a feeling amongst economists that governments have the ability to provide sound money 
And we see that in countries where the money system, monetary system is not sound, where people aren't sure that they want the currency because of inflation, we see that those countries are those countries tend to be less economically stable. We'll talk a little bit more about sound money here shortly. But these are the these are things that governments can do and, and should do to help enhance economic freedom. Additionally, there are some things that governments should absolutely refrain from, things that they should just not be doing if they care about their citizens having economic freedom. One of the things is that they should not put in place restrictions on personal choice. If people want to make a choice in a particular direction, unless it's going to hurt somebody else, they should be able to make their own choices. This is sort of depicted in our, in our picture here, where the government has, has put in place so much red tape that people can't make choices that are going to make their lives better off. At least they can't make them easily. And it may take weeks or months in order to get things moving because of all of the red tape. Those are things that governments should refrain from. And the government should additionally refrain from interfering with voluntary transactions. If people want to engage in transactions, and again, where the presumption here is that they're not engaging in, you know, in contract murder or, or things like that that are going to end up harming somebody else, Governments should step back and say, hey, you all want to exchange goods and services? Let's, let us get out of your way. Let us provide the roads so that you can get your goods and services from one place to another easily. And governments should absolutely refrain from limiting entry into markets. This is basically the idea that governments might step in and create or, or perpetuate monopolies. That's bad for everybody, as we've seen monopoly uh, outcomes have higher prices and lower outputs and people are not served as often and the total surplus in the economy drops, governments should not limit entry into markets. So we can kind of put a, a, a bow on this idea with this statement. Economic freedom is reduced when taxes, regulation, and government expenditures replace personal choice, voluntary trade, and market coordination. The more government you have, the more problems you're, you're likely to have. Ronald Reagan made the, uh, uh, the famous quip that some of the scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. His point was that if someone knocks on your door and tells and says those things to you, you should be terrified because their help, even though well-intentioned, is likely to have significant unintended consequences and not, and actually not lead to the help that you think you're going to get. So that's a little bit of the background behind what economic freedom is and, and the role of government in perpetuating and, and supporting economic freedom. Now, let's take a little bit of a turn here and start to try to understand this empirical measure of the economic freedom of the world index, what's in that index, and, and how it ties into this bigger idea of economic well-being. The economic freedom of the world index is, is, provides a, another way of thinking about uh, economic freedom, specifically as a measure of the degree to which scarce resources are allocated by personal choices that are coordinated by markets rather than being planned and directed by the political process. How do we measure that? Well, again, we need an empirical measure. And the economic freedom of the world allows us or provides for us that economic or that that empirical measure. It, it provides a measure of how closely institutions and policies of a country correspond with the ideas of limited government, of providing some public goods and sound money, but not a whole lot else. In other words, this is a, a measure of the degree to which institutions and policies of a country are consistent with economic freedom. So are the resources allocated by personal choice or the political process? 
that idea is captured in this index number. And again, how closely do institutions and policies correspond with limited government? That's in here as well. The Economic Freedom of the World Index has been around for quite a while. It's sort of the offshoot of a series of conferences hosted by Milton and Rose Freeman. Rose was Milton's wife, and she was instrumental in the work that he, that he undertook. Some of the participants in those conferences, like Milton Friedman, went on to win Nobel Prizes in economics. We have people like Doug North and Gary Becker and, um, and some other high-powered economists, uh, Peter Bauer and uh, William Niskanen and, and Gordon Tullock who got together and said, what's the role, what's the important thing that economic freedom, what does that mean to people? What does that mean for economic well-being? And so, sort of as the brainchild of these, this group of, of really important economists, we get the Economic Freedom of the World Index. The index itself is published by a group out of Canada called the Fraser Institute. They, along with a, a, a number of other free market groups help to underwrite the cost of collecting all the data and there is a lot of data in that goes into forming this particular index. So let's start to break down the index and try to understand its component parts. The index is based on three important methodological principles or really empirical foundations. The first one is that the objective components of the index are, the, are really what's important rather than value judgments. So if there's a subjective measure or subjective notion about what you think of free markets, we're going to try to pull that out of the index. We don't, we don't want that. We want this to be just a, a, a straight down the line, this is what it is, a very um, positive approach rather than a normative approach. The data are going to come from external sources. So um, we're going to go find, or the, the the people who put the index together are going to go find data from reputable sources that cover large blocks of countries. So we don't want just something that's very narrow in scope that can be that can be questioned in terms of the veracity of the data. So they get they collect data from the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and not country specific sources, which can be prone to. Um, uh, questionable validity. The index also is incredibly transparent. There are lots of explanatory notes ex letting the reader know, letting the user of the data know where the data came from, why this data was used as, as opposed to some other kind of data. So the empirical foundations are very clear and very, uh, very obvious and transparent. The index itself covers 162 countries going from every year from, the, from 2000 to 2017 and going back even further, but only covering data every five years because prior to 2000, uh, countries weren't providing data on a regular basis to the extent that when the data came out between those five years, sometimes it was quite a head scratcher, but every five years, at least the data seem to be pretty consistent. So we're talking about a lot of data, a lot of cross-sectional time series data here if you've had econometrics. There are 42 variables included in the index and those variables are ranked on a scale of one to 10, 10 being good, one being, being bad. So the bigger the number, the better it is for your country. Okay, so what is covered in the Economic Freedom of the World Index? Well, the areas of coverage include the size of government, so how big is your government relative to GDP, the legal system, the soundness of money, the freedom to trade internationally, and the degree of regulation of the credit, labor, the credit and labor markets and overall business what happens is each country gets an overall score, then each country gets a score for each one of these areas, and then you can, you can go into greater detail and greater depth as far as what makes up each one of these areas of coverage. But for our purposes here, I just wanna focus on 
uh, on the overall score, and then these particular areas of coverage. So let's start with the, with the first one, the size of government. When we're talking about the size of government in this, in this evaluation, we're looking at the extent to which countries rely on the political process to allocate resources, goods, and services. So how do government expenditures and tax rates affect economic freedom? Well, they affect economic freedom because if the government is more relevant to distributing goods and services, it means that there's, there's less of that ability for individuals to make those choices. So low levels of government spending as a share of total spending in a country and smaller government enterprise sectors and lower marginal tax rates score high on this particular measure. So the more government involvement, the more they're involved with running businesses. So as we talked about last, uh, talked about last week, the, um, the idea of state-run capitalism, those countries are going to score pretty low here. Let's take a look at the countries that do well in terms of the size of government by looking at the actual results from the Economic Freedom of the World Index. Okay, here's the homepage for the Economic Freedom of the World Index. They do break this down into different component parts. There's the Economic Freedom of North America, so you can see how different states rank. There's the Economic Freedom of the Arab World. There's the Human Freedom Index. So we're just looking here at the Economic Freedom of the World. And if you scroll down, you have all of the pertinent information, the executive summary, the, the full publication, the data. The data itself is available to you. But what I want to look at first here is the view. I want to view the interactive map. And here's what that looks like. Every country in the index has is listed here. And you can, if we play the uh, kind of the animations here, we can see how countries have changed over time. So back in 1970, there weren't a whole lot of countries in the data set. But as we go forward, we see more countries being added, and we can see those countries changing in terms of how free they are or how not free they are. And some of the countries change and some of them don't. So over time, we see the advance of the index, but also the advance of countries and how they score based on this particular index. So our most recent data is from the year 2017. The most recent publication was near the end of, the, of 2019, and there's a lag in collecting the data. And here we can see the, the most free countries listed on the left-hand side. We have Hong Kong at the top and Singapore, then New Zealand, Switzerland, the United States. And you can see on the, on the right-hand side, the arrows indicate the direction of the score. So there's Ireland, for example, dropped a little bit in the terms of their score. The UK, Canada just stayed put at number eight, or their, their score stayed put. Um, and so we see the, the countries sort of changing over time and the scores changing as well. And we can go on and see all the rest of the countries. If you just ho hover over one of the countries, any of these countries that are on the list, uh, there's Niger, for example, there's Ethiopia. Down here we have Myanmar. Here's Papua New Guinea. They're not very good at all. They're ranked 115th. There's the Ukraine, 135th. Venezuela, 162. So there's your, your dead last country right there. Um, and so the interactive map's kind of fun to, to, to play with a little bit, but I want to break, I want to spend a little bit of time here looking at the, the details of the country. So let's Let's do that. Let's move on to the, uh, to the component parts of the score. So in order to do that, we're going to take a look at the data by country. Okay, when you download the data by country, you get the data by the country. Uh, I'm just going to look at Ireland here. I've sort of been fascinated with Ireland and their economic performance over time. And what you find is that in, for each country, here are all of the data points that they have collected. So here's the summary rating, where the country was. And you see that Ireland wasn't always that great in terms of their uh, position, in terms of their status. They started to really do well starting in the mid-1990s. And then throughout the 2000s, we got uh, Ireland gets up into the, 
into the eight categories, which keeps them up near the top of the world rankings. Um, early on, there weren't that many countries, so a 6.73 puts Ireland at 15th. Today, a 6.73 would put you down well into the hundreds. The first couple lines here, we have the size of government and then some of the component parts of that government index. So there's 200. Here, this is the legal systems and property rights. Then we go down and then the component parts of that. The sound money category, the freedom to trade category, and then the regulation category. And each under each of the main topics, there are different subcategories for each country. And so you have all of the data that you need for every country within the, uh, within the index. And that's fine, but let's see if we can find some, some more um, easily understood data to compare each country within each category. To do that, we need to look at the, at the data for researchers. So once you download the data for researchers, you get this wonderful spreadsheet that gives you the opportunity to really mess around with the data and really investigate what's going on in, in different parts of the, the index. So the first country on our list alphabetically is Albania. And then this goes all the way down to probably yeah, Zimbabwe at the bottom. What we're going to do with this data is we're going to try to put in order based on each of the areas of the uh, kind of the, the major sub areas. We're going to put these in order and see if we can uh, tell who's, which countries are, are better in each one of these areas. So what I want to do is I want to find the order for these countries based on the sub areas. So we're looking at the size of government. That's this area in blue. And so I want to order these to see who's the best in terms of size of government. But if you notice, along the left-hand side, we have data that goes back. So we have our 2017 data, which is great, but it also has 2016, and it goes all the way back to, to 19. If we go all the way to the bottom of the list, we have 1970. So I don't want all that data. I just want the year 2017. So I'm going to go over here to the Year button, and I'm going to, I'm going to sort. Right now it's telling me Select All, but I don't want All. I just want 2017. I'm going to click Ascending, and that should get rid of all of the other years in the data set. So see, we stop at 2017 for Zimbabwe. Now I can click on the size of government, have that as Ascending. I just have 2017 data and let's see what I have. So at the low end, I have this country I've never heard of before, Brunei, Dar es Salaam. I've got Algeria, Libya. These are the countries with the size of government value that's the worst. If I go descending, I can see who's at the top of the list and I have a very interesting country at the top of the list, Guatemala, and Cambodia, and Honduras, and Nigeria, and Haiti, and El Salvador. These are countries that you wouldn't think of as having a really good score in terms of the size of government. The problem with these countries, and the problem with that particular measure, is that the reason those countries have that score is because their governments are basically ineffective, incompetent, and in some cases, just utterly dysfunctional. So just because you have a really good score in something isn't always the best. Hong Kong, for example, is, is ranked down here. They have a score of 8.19, but it's because their government is efficient and stays out of the way, whereas Guatemala's government is inefficient and is basically nowhere to be found. So we do have to be careful how we analyze these particular data. Now, Let's take a look at the next category. The next category is the category of legal systems and property rights. Here we're asking the question, does the legal system protect property? That's really the most fundamental question here. The keys in this area are whether there's a rule of law 
secure property rights, independent and unbiased judiciaries, and impartial, effective enforcement of the law. So with that, let's take a look at the data again and see who's at the top of the list. So now we're moving over here into this into this green area and I want to take a look at legal systems and property rights. We'll go descending this time to see who's at the top. And the countries at the top, ah, now these are countries we might have expected to see. Finland and New Zealand and Norway. There's Switzerland and Iceland, Luxembourg, Singapore, Netherlands. These are countries that are in the developed world, countries that we would expect to have sound legal systems. If we go down to the bottom of the list, who do we see? Probably countries we would expect to see. Oh, look, there's Venezuela. There's Haiti. Oh, Haiti. Yeah, your government's not very effective and neither is your system of legal, uh, legal system or property rights. So while they have, Haiti has a high score for government lack of involvement, it also has a really horrible score for government involvement in terms of protecting property rights. And just by way of a story here, when I was in Haiti a number of years ago, I was working with a group and a, a guy showed up and, and the work effectively stopped on the site and, and everyone was kind of like, uh-oh. The leader of the, of the site I was working on went out to talk to this guy. They talked for a little while and the leader came back and we were all like, well, what was that about? And he told us it was the local constable, the local sheriff, coming by to get a bribe. We were like, what, what, what did you tell him? He says, well, I'm not going to give you a bribe. And he went away. That's just the way business got done in Haiti, for the most part. Now, fortunately, my friend who works down there didn't have to deal um, too much with, with that type of system. The, the locals realized rather quickly that he wasn't someone who was just going to pay bribes to get what needed to be done. But that's the way things get, get done in Haiti for the most part. So there's our first two categories. Our next category is the soundness of money. So we're back to this question of whether or not the money supply is stable. What's the stability of the money supply? If it's stable, it reduces transaction costs and facilitates exchange and promotes economic freedom and, and economic confidence. Under this category, countries have to follow policies and adopt institutions that lead to low inflation and avoid regulations that limit the ability to use alternative currencies. So if a country prohibits the use of, say, the dollar, like, uh, like Cuba has done in the past, well, that's going to lead you to a low score. And if you allow your, your money, money to inflate tremendously, like ha has occurred in Venezuela, you're going to have a low score. So let's see who ranks where in the soundness of money. Now we're moving over here into this yellow category. We will click on descending again and see who's at the top of the list. At the top of the list, whoa, lo and behold, there's Switzerland. And look at that score. That's almost a perfect 10. The next, uh, the next country is a little bit surprising to me, El Salvador. I'm just not familiar with the El Salvador economy enough. Um, it could be that they're just on the dollar and that allows them to have a really sound currency. There's Singapore, Denmark, the United States, uh, Costa Rica, Taiwan, Hungary, who's on the euro, and Panama, who is on the dollar, all really sound, stable currencies. There's not a lot of inflation in these places. There is um, just really, really a lot of stability uh, and freedom to own foreign currencies in your bank accounts. So we tend to see countries at the top of the list here be the, the, the advanced countries in the world. At the bottom of the list, we're probably going to see, oh yeah, look at that horrible low score. There's Venezuela, that country with a million percent inflation. Uh, and I am not exaggerating. There's the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Sudan, Ukraine, Angola, the represent, uh, Rep, uh, Republic of Congo. These are countries where there's just not a lot of stability in the money supply. And again, countries that we shouldn't be surprised to see in that category. Our fourth area is the freedom to trade internationally. 
This particular category measures uh, trade restrictions, such as tariffs, quotas, any kind of hidden administrative restraints on trade, whether there are controls on exchange rates or the movement of capital. And the rating here is dependent upon whether you have low tariffs, easy clearance of customs, freely convertible currencies. So what is your, can you trade your currency from, for another country's currency easily? Whether there are few controls on the movement of physical and human capital. Can we move stuff across borders? That's what we're looking at here with this particular measure. So we're going to move one more time into a different color on our currency list here. This is kind of a broad one though, area four, uh, this international. So we've got uh, a whole set of categories here on tariffs, uh, non-tariff barriers. So let's get over here to the, the overall score and see what we have at the top of the list. Aha, there we are. These are the countries that trade a lot. Hong Kong, Singapore, country of Georgia, Netherlands, Panama, of course, with the Panama Canal. There's New Zealand. We see countries that are really heavily dependent upon trade, who want there to be a lot of trade. And we see a lot of countries in Europe, if we move down the list here, because of the freedom to move goods and services across borders in, um, in the, in the uh, European Union. I'm trying to see if I can find the United States relatively easily here. And maybe, ah, there it is. So the US is way down the list here. And this, of course, has something to do with the, uh, the discussion about tariffs and, and trade barriers. And I would say that if we looked at this data in a couple of years, the United States is probably going to fall down even further on this list. But if we look at countries down at the bottom, once again, we see countries in Africa, we see countries in the Middle East. Uh, countries where there just isn't a lot of trade or just not a lot of easy trade. There's Sudan and Libya and Algeria and once again Venezuela. So the countries that don't trade a lot, the, these countries down at the bottom of the list, no, start to notice something about where you are on the list and your relative position in the world in terms of, of economic well-being. These tend to be really poor countries. Poor countries aren't trading. And that's not a coincidence. Our last area of analysis here is regulation. And really what we're asking with this regulation category is whether or not those regulations interfere with the marketplace. Does it interfere with the ability to engage in voluntary trade? Does it limit information? Does it limit exchanges in the credit market and the labor markets? Is it easy to hire someone? Is it hard to hire someone? And how does uh, what are the regulations in, in just general product markets? So one last time, we'll go look at the data. And this data is in this kind of orange color. And there's a lot here to consider. There's credit market regulations. There's labor market regulations. There's business regulations. And then finally, their last column here is just the general regulations overall. And who's at the top of the list? Once again, there's Hong Kong. Hong Kong, sort of Southeast Asia here. We have New Zealand, Singapore, Fiji. There's the United States, ranked really quite high. Malaysia and Canada. Oh, and there's Brunei, uh, Dar es Salaam again. There's Switzerland, Australia. There's Ireland, Denmark. We start to see some of the um, countries of Europe, some of the countries that we're more familiar with. Down at the bottom of the list, who's the most heavily regulated? There's Brazil or Venezuela, there's Brazil, Sierra Leone, Egypt, Bolivia, Chad, Mozambique, countries that are not doing particularly well economically, in large part, well, in part at least, because it's hard to run a business in those parts of the world. So let's just one last time look at the overall standings here, for the, at least for 2017, and we will... Sort by descending. Now we'll go ascending here. There's Hong Kong at the top of the list. And we've seen Hong Kong being close to the top in some of these other categories. There's Singapore, New Zealand, Switzerland, the United States. These are countries that kept showing up near the tops of these particular areas. And if we go down the list, there's Venezuela. 
I mean, their score is so far below even 161. Their score is almost half of the second worst country in the world. And that just gives you an indication of the, of the difficulty that people have in conducting business there, the questions that they have in conducting business there. And if we compare these countries at the bottom of the list to the countries at the top of the list, we would see tremendous differences in economic well-being. But that's correlation. Does that necessarily mean causation? What are some of the patterns that exist here? Well, it just so happens that those high-income countries, they rank really, really high in areas two, three, and four, the legal systems and property rights, the sound money, and the freedom to trade. They tend to rank a little bit lower in size of government and regulation, particularly the regulation of labor markets. But these countries are doing really well in terms of establishing an environment in which economic activity happens efficiently and happens regularly and happens in, in volume. Weaknesses in the rule of law in sub-Saharan Africa, the Islamic nations, former Soviet blocs, Latin America, and Southeast Asia, that's, that's a, a, a burden on them. That's, a, that's a, a weight, an anchor on those countries. The rule of law just isn't followed very uh, consistently, and there may not even be a rule of law in some of these places. Um, that certainly leads to, to bad results in terms of their economic freedom score. What are some of the trends? What do we see over time? Well, in, in the 1980s, we see that free market principles start to be adopted in earnest. People are really um, advocating and pushing for free market ideas. And in a large part, that had to, to do with leaders of countries in the free world and that sort of the shaky foundation upon which the Soviet Union was resting. So in the 1980s, we see Margaret Thatcher from Britain and, and Ronald Reagan in the, in the United States pushing these ideas and their countries having enormous economic growth. As we move from the 80s and into the 90s, we see that trade is liberalized. We see deregulation and privatization of industries. We see regulations being cut. We see that tariffs fall. We see the formation of free trade zones, sort of the... the the movement of economic freedom was really afoot in the 80s and 90s. And we see this explosion of economic growth and this expansion of economic growth around the world. But in the 2000s, popular support for market economies begins to erode a little bit. We start to see seismic swings in terms of leadership in countries. So we see Hugo Chavez rise to power in Venezuela. We see Cristina uh, Kirchner in Argentina, and we see the uh, advancement or the the um, kind of the rising up of state-run capitalism, and so the we start to see this erosion of free market ideas and and people questioning how much a free market can do for a country in terms of lifting up the poorest of the citizens and and great concerns over income equality or inequality. These tend to be the trends that we've seen. So where does that leave us? So where does that leave us? Well, I think it leaves us with still a lingering question, but one that is certainly answerable. Economic research has been conducted, these, uh, these large country studies, including this variable of economic freedom and whether or not it does lead to economic well-being and, and, and higher rates of economic growth. And almost all of the research shows that it does, that Economically free countries are countries that have more prosperity in terms of that measure of, of real GDP per person. Now, whether the there's whether there is a correlation here in terms of causation is, a, I think, an, a relevant question, or whether it's that the countries that were already rich are just continuing to get richer. So, where does the economic freedom? fall in the chicken or the egg story? Is it that you're economically free and, it, and you become more prosperous or are you more prosperous and you become more economically free? That chicken or the egg story is a difficult one and I think it's one that economists and researchers are still trying to grapple with. 
Nevertheless, there is this relationship between economic freedom and macroeconomic well-being. And as we understand the importance of economic freedom in a time where there's a lot of uncertainty, I think it's important that we don't let things get out of control and let things run away from us. And, and it's important that we don't abandon the ideas of free markets and the importance of free markets in promoting prosperity, promoting innovation, promoting a spirit of entrepreneurship that can help economies and help societies move out of these periods of time where, uh, where governments seem a little bit uncertain, well, seem a lot uncertain in places about what should be done to stem pandemics and, and how, do, how, do we, how do we have uh, enough testing equipment and, and masks and ventilators? Where is that going to come from? It's not going to come from government. It's going to come from the private sector. As long as the private sector has the freedom to engage in production of those things. So th this idea of free markets is more important than ever. And should f markets be free to, uh, to produce the things that societies need and want? I think the answer is clearly yes. What kind of partnership should there be between government and the private sector? Uh, that's a question that still needs some answers and it's going to be one I think that we explore more, more carefully and more closely as the years go by.